welcome to Behind the Ticker. I'm Brad Roth, Chief Investment Officer of Thor Financial Technologies and Portfolio Manager of THLV, the Thor Low Volatility ETF. Behind the Ticker uncovers the inner workings of the ETF industry. We will interview portfolio managers and ETF service providers to dive deep into their work lives and their businesses. We will learn the inner workings of their strategies and what drives them as they continue to grow their company. Many of these individuals are entrepreneurs and will have unique and compelling insights to share as much goes on behind the ticker. Please note, nothing in this show is investment advice, and it is meant solely for educational and entertainment purposes only. Welcome to Behind the Ticker. Today we have Will Rind. He is the founder and CEO of Granite Shares. He has a very long and tenured career in the ETF business spanning over 20 years. He's worked on products like GLD and went out and launched his own firm, Granite Shares, in 2017. Uh, They have grown quite significantly, and today we're going to talk about their single stock levered ETF products with names like Tesla, Coinbase, and NVIDIA. Uh, Distribution and asset growth on these products has been very hot, so I think this Conversation is very timely and also very interesting to get Will's perspective on the ETF space as a whole. So without further ado, please welcome Mr. Will Rind. Will, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Brad. Thank you for having me on. Pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. So before we get started, can you share with everybody a little bit about your background and how you eventually ended up starting Granite Shares? Yeah, sure. I um, have been doing this for a long time, so over 20 years now. And my kind of history with ETFs goes all the way back to the beginning. So I'm originally from the UK and was involved at the time in the early 2000s with iShares or Barclays Global Investors, which everybody knows now as BlackRock. Um, We were launching the first ETFs in Europe. And I really just stayed with the product um, throughout my career. So after iShares, I did a startup. Um, that became very successful, that ultimately was sold to Wisdom Tree. Um, And then after that was the CEO of the World Gold Council's GLD uh, ETF, which is the largest gold and commodity fund in the world and partnership with State Street. And then ultimately uh, left there to set up Granite Shares in 2016. So I've been doing doing this since 2016 and, um, you know, building this ETF business. So I always like to ask uh, everybody before we kind of jump into it, when you're not working, you know, what are some of the hobbies or some of the things that you enjoy doing outside the office? Um, well, for me, I've got, I've got three kids. They're still relatively young. So a lot of what I do outside revolves around them. So you know, let's call it family time. Um, outside of that, I enjoy lots of things. I have always enjoyed traveling. I get to do that. Fortunately, um, as well as free time, so I've always liked travel. I like food, I like going to you know, restaurants, um, etc. And then in the summertime, less than the wintertime, I like um, boating and you know activities kind of on the water. That's great. Yeah, I I uh, I also have a handful of of little ones, and it seems like. Uh, as soon as you know, five or six o'clock rolls around, and then all day Saturday and Sunday, it's just their world, which is fine with me. It's yeah. great fun. <laughs> exactly. There's not a lot of room for for that much else, but we find we find the time. Yeah, we do. So let's talk about Granite Shares business as a whole. Um, you have a, a unique product lineup, and we're going to talk more specifically about kind of the single stock issues a little bit later, um, but. What types of products um, did you really set out to offer and kind of how has that business evolved over time? Yeah, so we think of ourselves as really being um, high conviction ETFs for the high conviction investor. And, you know, the reason why I say that is because we all know that, and especially previous shops that I've worked in, there's a huge amount of selection, a huge amount of choice in the ETF industry. But a lot of it is generic product priced, um, you know, Walmart style, pile it high and sell it extraordinarily cheap. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that those products tend to be um, obviously generic benchmarks, 
um, of which they've been done, you know, many, many times over. So if you're starting a company in the space, clearly you can't do something along those lines. You have to offer something different to people. You have to offer you know, a solution to a problem that exists um, and or capture, build a new segment of the market. And that's what we try and do. So high conviction ETFs to us can be anything from commodity plays to um, income plays to thematic ETFs to leverage. Um, but as long as it, it sort of captures that zeitgeist of conviction plays, um, it fits within our stable. Interesting. So, uh, let's talk about kind of the, the single stock levered ETFs because that you've seen tremendous growth there over the last, uh, you know, since they've been released. I was just curious as I was, you know, kind of reviewing the lineup is when you set out to make these, you know, did you have any issues getting these approved or having kind of the the levered and also inverse levered index products already out there? Did that make the path a little bit easier? So I think I, I would start by saying it's always difficult to get things approved um, when you're doing something for the first time. So you need somebody to kind of set the path or someone to build the runway, you know, before you can then land. Um, so in our, in our case, um, that was us uh, in terms of building that out. Now we had a little bit of a little bit of help or a little bit of experience in the fact that we've been doing this in Europe for a few years. So we started this business in Europe. Um, it's a very popular business there. Um, we operate in all major markets in Europe. So we did have experience doing it, always wanted to bring it here to the US. Um, but yes, clearly, we did go through a process um, to get there. Um, but ultimately, we were able to, you know, to bring those products to market. And we're excited about it. So when you when you set out to make the product and bring it to market, how did you go about um, kind of picking the names that you've picked? Right, you definitely have picked um, some of the more hot stocks, I would say. So, is there any rhyme or reason? Uh, I'm sure there is, uh, but you know, how do you go about picking what you want to create product for specifically in this single stock levered space? It is, but it, but I'll be honest with you, Brad. It's definitely more of an art than a science. Um, and we're not going to get it right all the time. But as I mentioned, we had some experience in Europe, so we knew the kind of stocks worked, at least for, for European investors. Now, that doesn't automatically translate clearly to the US, but hopefully the kind of high-conviction investor that we're looking for is a sort of, I would say it's a global crowd, um, and there's a lot of similarities. So a stock like Tesla is a good one, whereby... I think it's just a stock that has universal appeal. Almost whatever country you're in, um, you know, the US, all the major companies in Europe, it consistently shows up as sort of, let, let's say, number one or number two stocks held um, in kind of retail portfolios. So you, you have ones like that, which are maybe a bit of an outlier because they're so popular. Um, but we try also to marry popularity of stocks versus solving the problem or providing market access. So for example, Alibaba we have in our stable. Uh, the reason for that is because it's a dual purpose of, it provides access to Chinese tech, Chinese markets more broadly, um, but yet it's also a popular stock that people like to trade uh, to give exposure to just leverage for that company. Um, when we launched Coinbase, we have a levered Coinbase ETF. There was no leveraged crypto play in the market at that time. so. By doing a levered ETF on Coinbase, that was the only way that people could get leverage on crypto um, in an ETF form. So again, it was a sort of a proxy for crypto, proxy for Bitcoin, um, but providing leverage when no solution existed you know, prior to that. And then you know, NVIDIA, which has been our biggest one this year, um, obviously it provides leverage exposure to, to NVIDIA, but it caught the whole AI bug um, and really that stock became the, the stock for AI this year. And so that's been an amazing success story. Yeah, I, I'd say, and I want to talk specifically about that here in, in one second. And you you know as well as I do that, you know, kind of hot stocks or highly held stocks tend to kind of go through rotations over periods of time. Um, you know, you have kind of a, a radar in-house that you're kind of looking for maybe 
what's next, or as you said, it's kind of an art and you'll kind of know when you know that you need to maybe add, you know, one or two names to your stable. Yeah, I think, I think for us, it's less about the, the stocks themselves, because I think we have a very good idea of what might be popular. Um, the, 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 the boring answer to the question is that it's really more about managing costs from a business perspective, because running these funds is very expensive. So launching a fund and then managing it or maintaining it is very expensive. And so we just got to be careful that, you know, it's not like a fast food franchise whereby we just overexpand um, into like every small town in America and then flop a few years time because you can't support the growth. So we don't ever want to do that. We've got to be thoughtful about you know, how we grow. Um, I think we know, we know where we want to go. It's just a question of you know, managing it in a sustainable way. Well, I was actually going to ask this later, so we might as well we might as well talk about it now. You have grown quite fast. Um, I think first products were out in 2017. If I read the website correctly, yeah, correct. um, you know you've got a, about a, you know around 1.7 billion uh, of AUM on product. So as you've grown uh, and keeping that in mind, you know what changes have you had to make to the business in order to kind of handle that scale and that growth. So I think that um, the way that we've you know, been able to adapt is clearly number one is people. Um, so you know, outside of anything that that you do, um, it's you know having people to support the growth, to support the different um, investing functions, things that you have. Um, we're lucky in the sense that we built our technology um, kind of from day one and made a spine for the business. So. Uh, we'll do the chief technology officer uh, worked with us before in a previous company. Um, so he came on board and he was a team of developers um, that were uh, obviously for the company building our technology offering. And so we have, we like, it's, it, it's a very overused buzzword, but it is true um, in the sense that you know, we use technology to enable you know, everything that we do and we can make the core of our business from, from day one. So fortunately, you know, that's worked with us and helped us hugely in terms of being able to scale in terms of now, now products that we can that we can launch and then products that we can manage. You know, one go. yeah. So as far as like as far as scaling AUM is as well, are you you know have you uh, over time kind of scaled yourself uh, a sales force or or boots on the ground or are you letting kind of the product do the work for itself and making sure that, you know, people have eyeballs on it and awareness that it's out there. We've done everything. Um, but for this particular product and for this kind of offering, we definitely lean more into marketing um, than we do into sort of what you might call traditional sales. So again, when we think about our audience, our audience is a global community of high conviction investors. Um, those investors are typically mobile, you know, they have access to online trading accounts through neo brokers, etc. And, you know, those guys know what they want to trade, it's just a question of us making our product accessible to them. And so it's finding that sort of digital connection. And for us, it's a, it's a marketing first approach. So we spend a lot of time on, on PR, um, which is probably the most old school you know thing that we do, but it's still very effective. And everything else is all digital marketing type techniques um, to try and you know get our product in front of the right people. Sure, I guess staying staying here further, you know, you you're saying you know high conviction investors. Um, I would assume also these products are heavily used by uh, day traders as well. Um, is there any? Uh, is there any utilization? Or are you finding any utilization inside the you know registered investment advisory community? Are they using these somehow to maybe support a model portfolio or try to, in, in, in NVIDIA's case, um, or I guess in, in most of these cases, these stocks have done pretty well, is um, try to supplement return or generate alpha somehow? Or is it pretty much sticking to that high conviction or you know trading community? I think in the advisor space, it's a bit more tricky because the vast majority of money that's managed today is typically done in a some kind of managed portfolio. Um, and those, more often than not, are really kind of set. Um, and, you know, they might rebalance on a quarterly basis, but they're largely defined on the 60-40. Um, and so... 
those kind of model portfolios are long-term, you know, set and forget type money management offerings. Where you do get application is clearly anybody that's still trying to add value through alpha. That's really the key. So you get a portfolio manager, um, a stockbroker, an advisor, whatever you want to call them, um, that still believes that their job is to add alpha to their client's portfolio, meaning they're the portfolio manager, they're the one that um, is going to go and trade. And so that could be somebody who's a you know, follower or built their business around technical analysis, um, so more trading orientated, um, somebody that, you know, perhaps has their has their experience based in stock picking, um, all these things. But the key is it's somebody who believes that the job of, of an investment advisor is to offer, um, to, to beat the market, so to speak. Those people, there's application, but there's definitely, I'd say there are less of those people um, than there are in terms of the more long-term course so let's specifically talk about nvdl which is one and a half times nvidia so can you tell can we walk a little bit through the product construction and how we're getting the exposure and also getting the leverage sure so in the um, in the simplest form it's an etf just like any other and all leveraged etfs work the same um so they're typically providing exposure via swaps um, which is a derivative contract um, that you procure from an investment bank. And an investment bank, therefore, is providing you with the leverage um, via the swap contract to the fund. So you have collateral, um, you have margin, and you have a derivative contract that gives you that exposure. And all of these funds rebalance at the end of each day. That's why we target... Um, you know, the stated leverage factor, we call it, but that's why you'll see there's an amount one of times in the case of NVIDIA. Um, other funds is different. Let's say one and a half times, let's say we try to get one and a half times every day. So you mentioned some of the funds aren't all one and a half times. Is there any sort of uh, I uh, behind the scenes talk about why something might be 1.25, 1.5, or maybe 1.75. Does that have to do with the underlying volatility of the stock itself, or you know how does what drives that decision? Exactly. There's a there's a it's an SEC um, derivatives rule, which we and any other ETF has to abide by. Um, that's using derivatives, of course. And what it essentially does is you limit your leverage based upon the volatility of the underlying stock. So, you know, very simplistically, the more volatile the under the, the underlying stock, the less leverage you're going to deploy. The less volatile the underlying stock, the more leverage you're able to deploy. So, back to NVDL, um, the ETF is up quite significantly, you know, year to date. I, I don't want to give an exact number for compliance who. Uh, is definitely going to listen to this. So hello to uh, your compliance department. Um, so as, as far as that performance, uh, do have flows followed performance or did you see flows a little bit early on because of the uniqueness of what the product was offering? I think it could have both. I mean, it's, it's, it's always challenging because, you know, one of the most frustrating things about being an ETF issuer is we never see the actual order. In other words, the client never buys from us directly. Um, what we see is the net effect of all of the buys, all of the sales in the market on a given day, and the residual comes to us in the form of an order to create more shares or an order to cancel or redeem shares. Um, so it's difficult, but I think it's, it has to be a combination of the both. I mean, I looked yesterday, um, and NVIDIA, NVDL was the best performing ETF of the year. Um, so far so done incredibly well and whenever you get something like that you, when you top the charts um you're going to get people who are buying in because they see the performance um but we've had people buying in you know since the beginning of the year that just love the ai story and believed in the company and you know, wanted exposure i would i don't want to make the assumption but i would assume um when the market goes through volatility just like anything really that you're seeing flows maybe quicker than the average issuer to the other side, right? So you're getting more redemptions when there is volatility there because of the because of the leverage. Is yeah. that, I mean, is that is that right frame of thinking? 
Yeah, the way the way that the, the word we use internally is we say the platform is alive, um, <laughs> meaning that just on a daily basis we see tons of activity. We create and buys and sells every day. You know, orders coming through, and it can be in the same product on MBDL. You can get simultaneously, you know, a few orders to create shares and a few orders to redeem shares. Um, it, it's really quite unique and something that we haven't seen. Um, you know, certainly in our more dare I say it, traditional ETFs. Sure. So just out of curiosity, have you thought at all about making single stock levered inverses at all? Yes, we have. We have some. So they're, they're a kind of relatively new fixture. And again, it was we started with all long products just because the market naturally skews long. And you know, with our book, again, in Europe, um, the majority of that's long. Um, so you might have 20 to 30 percent of that short on any given day, um, but it, it's never 50 50. So we started with long here and we gradually introduced um, some leverage shorts as well. So we have Tesla, we have the highest or the most leverage um, short Tesla, so TSDD. Um, also on a video, we have um, 1.5 times short on a video MVD as well. So we do, we do have some shorts. We have a short AMD, and that one is not leverage it's just an inverse amd and that's largely again because the volatility thing we're talking about um yeah we were starting to introduce more shorts so out of curiosity i don't follow the european markets as much i'd like to get your kind of observation as we both know the etf issuance and product development has absolutely exploded here in the u.s is that is there similar product creations and in, in, is that business is as healthy as it is here in the United States? Um, it's, it's definitely healthy. It's not as healthy because America just has some fundamental advantages, which Europe will never be able to, to overcome unless, unless, well, certainly not in my lifetime, probably, but, you know, the, the U.S. has an amazing advantage before you start talking about any intricacies because you have one currency. You have one exchange, you have one regulator, and you have one language. And that, uh, those all might seem pretty straightforward to people, but that makes a massive difference for liquidity, for scalability, for consistency and continuity. Um, versus in Europe, you have multiple languages, multiple exchanges, multiple regulators, and all you're doing is sort of fragmenting your liquidity pool, fragmenting your scale, because you have to take you know, your product offering to each market and sort of do a um, you know, launch and, and you know, start a business in each particular market. So when we think of Europe, we think of one sort of homogenous entity, but it's absolutely not when it comes to, to the investment product. Yeah, I mean, I saw a flow chart of our market versus the European market, and it is about as complex as it can get over there <laughs> in comparison. Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. People love ETFs. It's just, there are just, there are just some fundamental challenges, which mean that the U S has accelerated, you know, far faster than anything in Europe. Um, and, and you know, some people will say that Europe's like five years behind where the U S is. And it's probably more right Yeah. So, well, uh, you have you know tremendous amount of experience in this space. You've worked with some of the largest ETFs uh, in the world. Um, what advice would you have for people who are either thinking about issuing today or newly issued um, as they're kind of entering the space? In order, what should they be thinking about and doing in order to make sure that they can? Um, run a successful business. This is kind of a loaded question, but run a successful business or or get the business to scale. The the big change that's happened in the last twenty years is that twenty years ago the barrier to entry into ETFs was really high. Uh, um, the to success was much lower. Nowadays it's flipped. So the barrier to entry in ETFs has never been as low as it is today. Meaning that. If you want to launch an ETF, you can do that. In other words, you don't have to set up your own manager or companies that you can go to that will create an ETF on your behalf. All you have to do is be able to write a check. If you can write a check, you can launch an ETF. So the, the barrier to entry has never been lower. The barrier to success, however, has never been higher. 
And that's because the product proliferation, the proliferation of product um, means that it's just harder and harder to get eyeballs on a new launch, harder for, for products to break through, harder for people to get shelf space on with distributors, etc. And it just becomes um, much more difficult unless you really know what you're doing. So that's really the fundamental thing to think about is that you know, anybody can launch, but it's really hard to succeed unless you're you know, have a very concrete game plan um, just because of where the market is and how it's sort of matured. Yeah, I, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't agree more, but again, Will, I really, really appreciate your time. This has been extremely interesting. Where can people learn more about you and where can people learn more about Granite Shares and your full suite of products? Best place is our website, which is graniteshares.com. Um, we've got a good amount of information there, um, really on, on all the products, everything that we do. I am on Twitter. We we're on LinkedIn. Um, but the, the best place for, as far as learning more about the business would be on the website. And then obviously there's multiple options to contact us directly, which people can do so freely. Well, again, Will, thank you so much. I appreciate your time and look forward to speaking with you again in the future. Great. Thank you so much, Brett.